yeah, yeah. All right. So continuing on with our conversation with author uh, Dr. Tyler Perry with his excellent book right here, we're uh, going to jump back into the dynamics of the marriage, uh, particularly jumping the broom in the ceremony. So the next question I had was, how, is, uh, how significant is the ceremony for a community, broadly defined, and people in terms of uh, legitimizing their unions? Yeah, so the I think the aspect of broadly defined is, is the key feature of the work in that in many ways this challenges kind of the traditional understanding of what we mean when we say getting married, right? right. So when people think of marriage, and there's even this you know common statement I, I found just scanning social media or different blog posts is that right. slaves didn't get married, right? I mean, you hear this all the time. And but what they mean by that is they weren't allowed to get married. But if you challenge what we mean by getting married, we have to decenter this idea that it's just a legal contract. Now, according to you know federal governments or, or nation states, you know, marriage is this legal contract that allots certain rights and privileges to people who engage within it. But when enslaved people talked about getting married, or really anybody who got married by jumping over the broom or in some folk ritual that may or may not have involved broomsticks, they said the word marriage and they meant it in that way. They, they saw themselves as just as legitimately and authentically married as anybody else. And that was particularly important for enslaved people, which I'll get to in a moment. But this extends back to the British Isles, which is really what starts the book. Um, and a lot of this began for me when I was trying to find the origins of the practice, which is a concept I backed off of because I'm not sure if that's a particularly important aspect. You know, where things begin when talking about folklore is pretty much impossible. All we have is what's available and what was documented down at some point in history, which may or may not reflect when it actually began. So when talking about folklore and the importance of rituals within a community, one thing that becomes very consistent across all of these different populations that used it, regardless of their circumstances, is that they all seem to unite around this idea that jumping the broom or the broomstick wedding or you know whatever language they may have spoken because there were different ways to say it depending on where you were is that that ritual when done in front of one's community and you know affirmed by that communal space that legitimated their union and then it, just to use maybe a more specific example in the case of Welsh practitioners in rural Wales in the early 19th century or late 18th century for them, that communal aspect was particularly important because it allotted certain rights to the woman who was getting married. Because according to at least the oral traditions of a particular Welsh community that was interviewed by a folklorist named W. Reese Jones, he noted that if the union was unsatisfactory really for any reason, the woman had an opportunity to jump backwards over the broomstick and if done within the same community that had, you know, affirmed their union, that legitimated the divorce as well. And, if, you know, not to give too much away, but here's a spoiler. <laughs> to get divorced <laughs> by jumping over the room, you just jump backwards. And so it, it prevent it got around this really complex process of seeking a divorce, um, getting it legitimated through paperwork by a government bureaucrat who may or may not look at you favorably. Right. And so for many people, there was a certain practical benefit to getting married within a communal space using a folk ritual that had some significant symbolic meaning right. to that particular group. And so the argument that I'm making is that if you begin in this area of the world, which has the most extensive documentation of broomstick weddings, you find that not only did it um, influence the cultural traditions throughout the nation state, so acquired by British Romani groups, some evidence of Irish traveler communities using it, it was um, associated with Scottish practitioners, but also Anglo-Saxon dock workers, people who lived kind of this existence where they were constantly in motion. Mm -hmm. um, the broomstick wedding was very important for all of them as 
maybe not being recognized by the government, but recognized by their immediate friends and family members. And that was very important to them. You take that mentality and you cross the Atlantic. Now all of a sudden you see it being practiced by a group of people who are legally forbidden to have their marriages recognized with each other. Now, this might seem like an obvious point, but you know, process of elimination, it does make sense that enslaved people might see some attraction within the ritual, regardless of how it was introduced. Right. And there's some debate as to how it came to the, these various enslaved communities. And one of, the, I think, the most important points I make is that previous scholarship has kind of generalized the practice to the point where uh, many people didn't really bother to investigate the ritual extensively. They would use one or two quotes. And you come away with the impression that, you know, all enslaved people did this and they did it in one in one particular method, like this you know, homogenous way where they just jumped over a broom and then they they were wedded. I was determined to find that this was a much more complex and complicated process, and which actually made it far more interesting, knowing that you could literally have different ways to practice it from one plantation to the next. Um, they could be five miles apart, for instance, and they would do things completely differently. Now, there was obviously a network under which all of this was engaged. Um, it is likely that in many instances, um, slave owners introduced the practice probably as a way to either mock or not take seriously the, the weddings of enslaved people. In other instances, it seems clear that enslaved people and poor whites were exchanging this type of ritual knowledge with each other through kind of these underground networks in which they fraternize with each other in, in different ways. And so I was relying upon um, the work of scholars who have looked at those relationships previously as a way to, to find the different ways that the ritual is coming to the United States and being adopted and then adapted by enslaved communities throughout the U.S. South. And one of the really extraordinary features of this entire narrative is that it's not entirely clear when jumping the broom comes to enslaved people in the United States, but it doesn't really appear before the 1800s as far as in the documented record. And there's a variety of reasons that I go to for why that is, but it doesn't seem to have been acquired until about the 1810s in any significant way. Okay. Which means that for the next 50 years, which is maybe one or two generations of people, it had spread all the way from Virginia to the Deep South, all the way to Eastern Texas. So you have this massive collection of people separated by thousands of miles from each other, all talking about how they or their ancestors jumped over a broomstick. And so that was a really interesting way to understand how things are being communicated both across plantations, but also as people are migrating west, um, particularly forcibly as the Cotton South is expanding all the way to um, what would be called the Old Southwest at that point. And so all of that to say, another aspect to consider is it is far more prolific than I think it's been given credit for as far as influencing the marital traditions of not just enslaved people, but also Euro-American communities. And I say Euro-American intentionally because at this point, to be very honest, it's not entirely clear if most people see Cajuns as white, right? They're obviously people of European French descent, but the way under which they're treated prevents you know, them claiming whiteness in the way that benefits them um, at this moment. But so I kind of go back and forth when talking about poor whites versus European Americans, because in the context of the early 19th century, one of the reasons that Cajuns retreat into the bayous is that that way they're left alone, more or less, in, in many respects. And they're able to preserve certain cultural traditions, um, like jumping over the broomstick okay. as well. But in the case of uh, European American communities or Appalachian white communities, their circumstances uh, essentially render them unable in many cases to acquire a minister or a priest at that point to actually marry them in, in immediacy. Right. We take this for granted today because right. you can literally go on the internet, become an ordained minister and marry one of your friends like yeah. in, in a few weeks. Um, but that option wasn't available to people. 
So for them, they had determined that if they wanted to secure the legitimacy of the union, the community had to endorse it. And then the individuals could go um, and be, begin their families uh, with one another uh, without worrying about living a sinful existence, I suppose. And so the idea here is that we will marry you communally if you have, if you promise to get married at the next appearance of a minister that comes through mm, town. Um, and so for the African Americans who continue the broomstick tradition after slavery is ended by the Civil War, they seem to largely mirror that aspect of the importance of the broomstick wedding, um, because now they have a choice as to whether or not they want to do it. But for them as well, sometimes they lived in such rural conditions that they themselves were also uh, captive to just geographical circumstances that made it very difficult to actually register your marriage with the local governmental official. And so this is maybe a long-winded way of conveying that it seems pretty consistent across the board that the attraction of the ritual was that it was easy to do. Most people had brooms, but also we shouldn't dismiss the value of a broomstick. Um, now we can go to the store today and buy very cheap ones made of plastic, usually with a few straws attached to it. But the process of making a broom, uh, particularly in the antebellum South, particularly amongst enslaved people, this was a skilled trade. This is something that was taken very seriously and they could fetch high prices if sold on the market. And so when we look at people holding brooms uh, during the antebellum era, those were those tools were very important to them. It wasn't just a throwaway item, but that if you jumped a broomstick, something that um, preserved the cleanliness of your house, that had to have meant something significant to me. Right? And I think it's something that modern audiences might take for granted a little too much. So one of the things that I tried to do was even within that section where I talk about enslaved people is talk about the importance of broom manufacturing upon the plantation yes. and the, the process of curing the broom straws and how, I mean, even Frederick Douglass says the, this particular set of broomstick makers were, um, looked upon um, very favorably by the broader community for the skill and the trade that they possessed. So all of this to say, the reason that I wrote the book, one motivation I had is that I thought that, number one, the ceremony was being generalized too much, which was leading to a lot of assumptions about where it came from, how important it was, whether or not people should still do it, but also looking at the ceremony for all that it entailed, not just the leap over the broomstick, not just the individuals getting married, but the entirety of it. who attended, who right. was holding the broom, right. who was jumping, why did they jump a particular way, what type of broom did they use, because there were different ones, as I discovered. And so all of this, I think, was a way for me to even reassess my own assumptions about the ritual as I was writing the book, which in retrospect, I'm actually very grateful that it took so long for me to finish it, because I think that if I would have written this book five years ago, um, it would have been a lot less rich for the types of questions I was asking, particularly being inspired by, you know, the study, Black studies as a profession in general, and, you know, this idea of how the past remains important to the present, and that nothing just has to be just a chronological narrative all the time, but that you can look at the way different things can be associated with one another as you are doing your research or teaching about a subject too. Yeah, I mean, you hit on some really important points that I just uh, I want to reemphasize to people like um, there's so much value in this book, I believe, um, that as you point out that it's about networks, it's about, to me, the biggest thing I took away um, I'm curious to see what your thought is on this, is the empowerment of this act, right? That it, it, it was a demonstration of power, even as the, these various peoples are being oppressed in a multitude of ways across expansive periods of time and spaces. Like that is, is truly, really uh, forced me to rethink a lot uh, of, the, of the dynamics of, of a common law or, you know, the, the non-legal marriage, because I, as someone who studies the Northern Black experience, I can see a lot of ways in which Northern Blacks um, did this as well, right? That they saw their communities respected them. It comes out in the pension records a lot. 
um, that they were Mr. and Mrs. And they were called that as such. And as you rightly point out that the community was there um, and the, the empowerment for the individuals to leave if necessary, for whatever reason, you know, for human nature, maybe they just grow distant over time. There might've been unfortunately domestic problems, including violence, which I've seen in cases for USCT soldiers. Um, so I think that that's really important. And also, as you say, the symbolism of the broom and the event um, that we need to recognize that this is how the communities uh, respected and saw these people. Um, so I just think this is a method that many, people need to think about applying um, to not only African-American experiences, but as you point out, people even from European descent. Yeah, yeah I mean, you've, you've raised a lot of things, particularly those that, that motivated my reason for investigating this to the extent that I did, because I'll be very honest with you, I don't share this very often, but um, there were more than a few prominent people that doubted you know the the viability or the importance of this project because they're thinking he's writing about broomsticks right or he's writing about just this folk ritual that appears occasionally and works on slavery and so i i, I would never name names because i don't think it's that important but there there were a few so any graduate students who have doubts about the importance of your project just know that the guy who wrote the book on jumping the broom was right. doubted when he was a graduate student um, early on but fortunately i had more supporters than detractors and so i think that's the first point that leads into this broader discussion about a suggestion for readers is i actually encourage you to read the footnotes particularly when i'm quoting these formerly enslaved people when they're talking about it because one of the reasons why some of the footnotes are so dense is because i wanted to make sure that people had a reference point yes. for understanding how individuals conveyed their story and this is important because the the debate surrounding Jumping the Broom has always been, ever since it was revived in the 1980s and the 1990s, was, you know, why do this? Why, why revisit a slave ritual? Mm -hmm. What benefit does this have for anybody in the late 20th or now early 21st century? And it goes back to what you mentioned, is this idea of agency, making choices. Right. And so for me, you know, I've been, doing this long enough to where I've started to kind of see how historiography changes and adjusts with the times. Yes, yes. But, you know, when I really, when I started really consuming works on um, slavery in the antebellum South, but also the African diaspora, mm -hmm. the scholars that first started teaching me really emphasized the works on agency. They emphasize yes, the yes. works on culture yes. and you know, the dynamic yes. formations yes. of family life. And, you know, obviously the, the newer work is important, which stresses kind of brutality and, and other areas of slavery and, ex, you know, capitalism and, you know, the abuses that enslaved people endured. For me, going back to those works by people like John Blassingame, Eugene Genovese in the 1970s, who acquired, who really first accessed some of these older narratives as a way to challenge people like Kenneth Stamp and U.B. Phillips, that always inspired me. And I was always greatly interested in finding these stories. And so for me, one thing I notice about people who are thinking about using this ritual in their own marriage as a way to pay homage to the ancestors, they're not being introduced to the works that are actually quoting what people said right. about the reasons why they used it. Because if, if you just approach this as kind of a generalized ritual that enslaved people used, I guess it might make sense that you would question the viability of that type of practice. Like why, why, what does it mean? Right. We truly understand what it means if we bother to actually read what people said about it. Like what are the sources historians are using? And so for me, writing an entire book on the subject, I thought was at least a way to intervene in the popular cultural aspect of it, because I think it's important that people are equipped to understand the source material that historians are accessing, not just one or two or three references here and there, right. but really looking at, you know, the over 100 some odd narratives that I found and looking at the distinctions in the way people talked about it. After you've kind of read through this material, I think you can make an appropriate decision as to whether or not 
it is right for you personally. But one thing that I think the book hopeful, or at least I hope it makes clear, is that this was not just a given for any particular person, but that people made very calculated decisions as to how they did or did not begin a new family with a person that they were courting. And I mean, I just want to close with this important point for this uh, part of the interview is read the footnotes, right? And, I, and I, I'm grateful that you mentioned that point because this, this work should hopefully be continued. Obviously, many scholars have looked at African-American families um, and now we have even more sources, as you point out, that are digitized, that are readily available and accessible. So this is not the end, right? Nor is it the beginning, but this is clearly in this, this important shift in the refocus and recentering of what does this ceremony mean to be too many people, clearly, as your book shows. Absolutely.